was a strange journey in that army ambulance to the silent, darkened city. Mama and I sat, not speaking. The only moving figures on the streets were English soldiers. Two armed soldiers stood outside the door of my father's room. My father lifted his head from the pillow as we came in. You know what this means, he said. Mama broke down. Don't, Lily, he said. Don't. You'll unman me. But your beautiful life, James, she sobbed. Your beautiful life. And he said, but hasn't it been a full life, Lily? And isn't this a good end? People have a one-dimensional image of James Connolly, the injured revolutionary leader tied to a chair and executed here in Kilmainham Jail for his part in the Easter Rising 94 years ago. But this was just a culmination of what he said on the eve of his death was a full life. Behind the mythology, there's so much more to the 48 years of James Connolly's great life. He was a complete man, a campaigner, worker, husband, self-taught intellectual, powerful speaker, revolutionary thinker and doer, a true champion of the ordinary man and woman on the street, truly Ireland's greatest. For some, James Connolly is a 1916 patriot, a soldier, a union leader, and a great political thinker. For others, he's an idealist, a lefty, and a socialist dreamer. But James Connolly is my hero because he was a real human being with passion, dreams, and flaws who dedicated his life to working class men and women, not only in Ireland, but around the world. And ultimately, they were his words which inspired the 1916 proclamation, which defines our innate sense of decency and fairness as a society. That is the greatness of the man. When I arrived here in Trinity in the late 70s, one of the first things I came across was Connolly's writings. The first one I purchased was this, Labour in Irish History. And I remember reading it, and I just couldn't get over the freshness of it, the energy of it. And I just remember almost being mesmerized as I turned the page and another chapter would emerge, and you'd be saying, oh my God, that's dead right, that's right. I think I knew what most people knew, and that is about the death of Connolly, not about the life of Connolly. I didn't know, for example, of his absolutely prolific writing, and also his, how accessible his writings are. They're still in print, they're still selling, and above all, they're still relevant. In fact, what he wrote about then is probably even more relevant in the Ireland of the first decade and a half of the uh, 21st century. That's amazing to think that almost 100 years after Connolly wrote about the dangers of the relentless pursuit of profit, Ireland finds itself in the situation we are in today. And it's especially ironic when you consider the sort of poverty James was born into in Edinburgh in 1868, he was the youngest son of penniless Irish emigrants who ended up in the Cowgate district of the city, a slum area known locally as Little Ireland, where tens of thousands of people lived in horrible, squalid conditions. The first-hand experience of poverty was to cast a long shadow over James Connolly's entire life. His parents, John Connolly, Mary McGinn, famine emigrants, fled Monaghan, came here to Edinburgh. His father became a manure carter, which basically means a shoveler of animal and human excrement. And he rose in his life to finally become the supervisor of this public toilet here in Haymarket in Edinburgh. In Cowgate, overcrowding, poverty, disease, drunkenness and unemployment were rife. 
The immigrants were mostly unskilled labourers, work was difficult to find, and the newly arrived Irish were seen as the lowest of the low. And if that wasn't tough enough, Connolly had chronically poor eyesight, had a bit of a stammer, suffered from rickets as a child, and at an early age lost his mother to bronchitis. He had to take whatever life threw at him. Just try to imagine the poverty of the life of James Connolly here in Cowgate. Nine years of age, he'd left school, was working in a printer's, a baker's. One contemporary described this place, the narrow streets, the dingy tenements, the foul smell, the heavy, murky smoke, the toppling chimneys and the battered and patched roofs of Cowgate. And then to get out of this abject poverty, James Connolly did what so many did at that time, they'd no choice, and that was he joined the British Army. James Connolly's very first visit to Ireland was when he was posted there as a British soldier. It was also how he met Lily Reynolds, an educated Protestant girl from Wicklow who was working near his barracks as a servant. By falling in love with the young soldier, Lily secured for herself a life of upheaval and tragedy, but she became the rock James Connolly was built on and would be by his side until the eve of his death almost 30 years later. For James and Lily, it was the British Army that started and ended their lives together. It was like that for so many uh, Irish families. The First World War, my grand uncle, Kit Carroll from Church Street in Dublin, he was killed Easter Monday, and he was to die in the same month as James Connolly. And um, while he was fighting in France, I'm sure his family in Church Street, in the heart of Dublin, were probably supporting the rebels against the British Army. So all their lives are entwined with the British forces. James and Lily married in Scotland in 1889, and having discharged himself from the army, the 21-year-old Connolly went looking for work to support Lily and their young family. He tried various jobs, including shoveling manure and human excrement, like his father before him. He even had his own cobbler's business. But throughout this period of his life, he found it hard to keep any of these jobs, and even harder to make ends meet. When Connolly closed up his cobbler's business here in Edinburgh, he said, I'm going to buy myself a mirror so I can watch myself starve. But funnily enough, it was his greatest flaw, this, this lack of employability that he turned to his advantage because he had time to think, to muse and to act and organise. And he became involved in the politics of employment, the politics of work. James Connolly had found a cause. But my God, he worked for people. He wanted to improve people's lot. He would have held meetings here in Prince's Gardens in the centre of Edinburgh to try and bring people together. He believed in merit, he believed in self-improvement. That's what James Connolly was all about. Ignited by idealism, he became involved with the Scottish Socialist Federation and came under the influence of Keir Hardy, founder of the Scottish Labour Party. Within five years of his marriage, James had stood twice for election, fighting for workers' rights. This was the birth of James Connolly, activist and campaigner. Can you imagine the Scotland of the 1890s, people arguing, debating about the great new political belief, socialism. And James Connolly was at the heart of it here in his hometown, but he also wrote about it, and I read him, what, nearly 100 years later, and I'm reading things like, the child of a manual labourer should not die a manual labour, that there was hope, that there was prospect for change in society. And the relevance of James Connolly, to me, a hundred years later, to discover that was absolutely electrifying. He still had no permanent job. Life was very tough for the Connollys. Something needed to change. And now we come to a major turning point in the life of James Connolly and his family. Totally destitute, they look at their options. They even consider emigrating to Chile, where the government are offering land opportunities for emigrants. But Lily is totally against it. There's only one other option. Through his Scottish option, through his Scottish socialist friends, he's offered a job as organiser of a socialist club, the princely sum of one pound a week 
Where? Dublin. In 1896, James and Lily returned to the city where they had first met. James was now a 28-year-old father of three with a fourth child on the way. He and Lily set up home in tenements just like this one, first in Charlemagne Street and then Pimlico. But the job that brought James back to the city only provided a tiny, irregular wage. Life was no better than it was in Edinburgh. At the beginning of the 20th century in Dublin, one in three people were living in tenements. Places like this teeming with children, teeming with noise. The doors left open all the time. Water sanitation was outside the room. Cooking was on the open fire. Mortality rates in these tenements for babies was the highest in all of Europe. The people who lived here would have been manual laborers, eking a living going from job to job. There was no stability. They'd walk down the docks, they'd walk carting or carrying, up at the fish market, the fruit market, whatever work was to be come by. There was no social welfare. There was no unemployment benefit. There was no safety net. There was no help apart from the church or St. Vincent de Paul for people who were in dire, dire poverty. James was not only trying to make a living outside for his family and bringing home whatever he could, which is very, very, very meager. Uh, he was also trying to write here. He was trying to organize and try to spread an energy among people to try and better themselves. At this stage of his life, Connolly was no great political hero standing up for the downtrodden. He was the downtrodden. There was no money coming in. The family were constantly pawning possessions to stay afloat or to buy work clothes for James to get a day's labour. Once he even went to work with lily slippers tied to his feet with laces. Connolly's socialist principles and public organising were not helping him to get any work, so he had a lot of time on his hands. As an avid reader and self-taught scholar, he ended up spending a lot of that spare time reading, thinking and staying warm here in the National Library. In here are the origins of Connolly's unique thinking. When he arrived in Ireland, he was a committed socialist, but in here he learned that republicanism and socialism were inextricably linked. And the only way to save the working man from his poverty and his slavery to the bosses was a worker's republic. Connolly read widely ancient Irish history, sociology and the development of human behaviour just to see if he could trace the natural origins of socialism to show that it wasn't just some intellectual invention. He could see socialist structures and the way the old Irish clan system worked across thousands of years of Irish history. He saw the ancient clan attitudes to land ownership as a kind of Celtic communism, and he believed this would make socialism connect to the ordinary Irish man or woman, to make it resonate with being Irish. Connolly hibernicised socialism. In international terms, that's what he's still highly regarded for to this day, taking a pure global theory and applying it to the needs, the realities and beliefs of people in one country, making it relevant to the working man. The young James Connolly took his political ideas to the next level. He helped form the Irish Socialist Republican Party and the manifesto he wrote was way ahead of its time. He called for the establishment of an Irish Socialist Republic. It's one page manifesto with some great lines that give you an insight into his thinking and his destiny. He wanted to nationalise the rail, children, free education and votes for women and that's in 1896. In fact, Connolly was an ardent feminist and a great friend of another feminist and revolutionary, Maud Gaughan. He once wrote that if a worker is a slave, then a woman is the slave of that slave. He was well ahead of his time in terms of women's rights, and without him, the mention of Irish women would never have made it into the 1916 proclamation. Having established his political party, Connolly's activism became more pronounced in 1897, he and Maud Gaughan organised very public and provocative protests around the Jubilee celebrations for Queen Victoria. 
not surprisingly, standing up for a workers' republic against the oppression of Victoria's empire did not go down too well. One of the stunts involved Connolly bringing a black coffin down Sackville Street with the words British Empire emblazoned on it. Faced with the police at the bridge here, he dumped the coffin into the Liffey. And as a result, he spent his first night at Her Majesty's pleasure. He was 29 years of age. The following morning, Maud Gaughan brought him breakfast, bailed him out. The revolution in his head had just begun. Connolly may not have been working, but he certainly kept himself busy. He organised celebrations for the centenary of the 1798 rebellion. He stood for his seat on the council in Wood Quay, and he used skills learned in Scotland as a young printer's devil to publish his party's pamphlet, The Workers' Republic. Connolly's commitment and dedication. He not only wrote the pamphlets, he typeset them, printed them, and then went out and sold them. And he used the slogan from the French Revolution on the front of the Workers' Republic. The great appear great only because we are on our knees. Let us arise. The worst problem is he's still as poor as a tr because of his growing reputation as a campaigner and a protester. For Christmas 1900, as a father of five children, he managed to bring home just two shillings in wages. The family had no Christmas dinner or presents. On top of poverty and tenement squalor for the family came disillusionment. Despite his own unflinching commitment, James discovered that his party was floundering and subscriptions were being misappropriated into drinking dens. Connolly was on the brink. But in the beginning of 1902, the Socialist Labour Party of New York reprinted his pamphlet, Aaron's Hope, and it went down well. He was invited on a five-month speaking tour of the US, and within a year of that, he was emigrating for good. He said he had no wish to return to Ireland like a dog to his vomit. Lily said, if we go to America, we will never come back. We will not give them the chance to break your heart again. The American socialists who brought Connolly to the US wanted to encourage Irish American workers who saw socialism as godless and anti-Catholic to join the socialist movement. They needed a talented and persuasive public speaker who could connect with Irish Americans. Connolly fitted the bill perfectly. The location chosen for his first public engagement was one of the country's most prestigious venues, the Cooper Union in the heart. Here in New York, he was invited to speak. He wrote to a friend, the prospect sent a cold chill of nervousness up my spine. James Connolly was rattled. Of the 12 American presidents, from Lincoln to Clinton to Obama, that have spoken here, this is the most prestigious speaking venue in all of the United States. When Obama spoke here a few months ago, he lacerated Wall Street, story covered all over the world. James Connolly, 35 years of age, who came from nothing, self-taught, self-educated, was invited here to speak and address a gathering of New Yorkers. James Connolly stood up here and said, here I represent the only class to which I belong, the working class. And no doubt, as his speech went on, he ended with the words that he made famous. The great appear great because we are on our knees. Let us arise. The speaking tour went well. After a brief return to Dublin, Connolly was back in the United States and eventually raised enough money from public speaking and selling pamphlets to send for Lily and the children to come and join him in the promised land. This was a new beginning. It should have been a family reunion to save her. So James gets a message, come down here to collect his family. They've been processed on Ellis Island, hasn't seen them in six, seven months, has six growing children, counts them off the ship, 
there's Nora, there's Ina, there's Aideen, there's Maura, there's Roddy. But where is Mona, the eldest? He asks Lily, Lily breaks down, Ina bursts out, she's eight years of age, Mona is dead. On the day before they were due to set sail from Ireland, Mona's apron catches fire on the open stove and she's accidentally born to death. Their new life in America has begun with a disaster. The impact it must have had on a father arriving here to see his six growing children, hasn't seen them in months, to see the difference, the sports, the changes, the brightness, and to realise and discover right here that one of them had been killed and buried back home in Ireland. James wrote home to a friend in Dublin. The death of Mona darkened our lives and changed all our hopes and prospects. In spite of Mona's death, the family did settle into the American way of life. They based themselves in upstate New York, where James sold insurance door to door. And for a brief period, life for the Connollys was good. They even celebrated the arrival of another child. But as factories mechanised, employment dropped, and people stopped buying the insurance James was selling. As far as he could see, beneath a glossy surface, when it came to the treatment of ordinary workers, America was no different to anywhere else. The iconic symbol of the bull here in New York's financial district, just off Wall Street, James Connolly, Lily, six children he now had, would have walked up and down these streets, maybe on a summer's day or whatever. But James knew who suffered when capitalism ran amok just like that ball. It was the workers. He wrote in 1900, 110 years ago, during a docker strike for better pay, James wrote, workers are regarded by their masters, not as human beings, but simply as numbers on a balance sheet. How true that is, how true it is today. James Connolly, the people's prophet. The turn of the 20th century was the dawn of the modern American dream. Electricity, production lines, Henry Ford's motor car, the Wright brothers' empowered flight. America was the future. Millions flocked to its shores. After selling insurance became a dead end for James Connolly, he and his family moved to New Jersey, and James went for a job in the Singer sewing machine factory. 9,000 people working here. James comes down looking for a job, of course. Whips off his glasses. They wouldn't employ people with spectacles, believe it or not. Says they want a lathe operator. Can he operate a lathe? Of course he can, he says. He goes home that night. He hadn't a clue. He spoofed his way into that job. Gets out the manual. What does James do? Learns how to operate the lathe. Gets the job the next day in this incredible ferment of 9,000 people, Germans, Irish, Italians. So he learns German and he learns Italian and he's able to speak to the workers here. The greatness of James Connolly was on many occasions his downfall. His ideals didn't pay the bills and his dedication to the cause made things much more difficult. He saw socialism as a way of trying to address people's real needs and concerns, and he kept putting other people's needs above his own. And that is how his time at the Singer factory came to an end. And of course, it's in his DNA, he's taking up wages and the long working hours and the conditions of the workers. Who want rid of him? The powerful once again, the bosses. They tell his foreman, get rid of Connolly. The foreman likes James, goes to him and says, they're out to get you. They're saying they'll sack me if I don't sack you, James. James says, once more, cause over comfort. He stands up, he says, don't you be losing your job. I'll take the hit. And he resigns from the Singer factory. Crucially, America introduced James to a new trade union, the Industrial Workers of the World, also known as the Wobblies. They were promoting a new concept of one I'll sack you, James. James says, once more, cause over comfort. He stands up, he says, don't you be losing your job. I'll take the hit, and he resigns from the Singer factory. 
Crucially, America introduced James to a new trade union, the Industrial Workers of the World, also known as the Wobblies. They were promoting a new concept of one big union fighting for all general and unskilled workers, much to the displeasure of employers. After leaving Singer, Connolly became an organiser for the Wobblies in Manhattan. I was interested to learn from present-day Labour leader Joe Jemison just how dangerous it would have been for James back then standing up for workers' rights. At the beginning of the 20th century here in New York, when Connolly arrived, surely politically must have been one of the most exciting places on earth. At the time that Connolly was here, there's a lot more industrial violence than there was either in the Ireland that he left uh, or in Ireland, say, in recent decades. But uh, he was active with the uh, in, uh, Industrial Workers of the World, which was a syndicalist organization, which had come out of the Western Federation of Miners. Now, a mine strike in the US at the turn of the 20th century was almost like a civil war. Uh, you had uh, goon squads from the employers, and the miners were not shy about returning gunfire for gunfire. So when they went back to Ireland, which in 1910, which was experiencing this ascending curve of industrial violence leading to the big lockout in 1913, uh, Connolly was the one who had the brains and the intelligence and the experience to organize the citizen army. What's his legacy here in the States? He was one of the founders of industrial unionism and the thinking behind it. That not only influenced a later generation of US trade union organizers, it influenced people in Scotland, it influenced people in Britain. And in Ireland, it's the legacy of uniting the national and the social. It's obvious you admire, you admire him. Absolutely. This, he was the most serious of men. He was not uh, a dilettante in any way. Didn't hang around in cocktail parties with intellectuals. He uh, would prefer to be out speaking German or Italian and organizing real workers into into unions or into the Socialist Party. And it was the moral nobility of the man. He asked a lot of his family in terms of not being around, mm -hmm. uh, and his wife especially, Lily. Uh, they uh, put up with the sacrifices. And if you read the works of his daughters, they revered him. He was a, he was a hero. He was larger than life to them, not only to his, uh, to his union colleagues. Just as in Ireland, Connolly's profile as a Labour campaigner in New York meant that he was unable to earn a regular income. And as a result, his family was still destitute. But then for James, the cause was always more important than comfort. It's 1910, James Connolly is 42 years of age. They've been seven years here in the States, himself, Lily, and now six kids. Remember, they left Dublin to get away from the tenements. They're here in New York. Where are they living again? In a tenement. James is working all the days that God will give him, union organiser, selling pamphlets, writing pamphlets, travelling all over the country. Still, they could not make ends meet. Connolly wrote at the time about the working man who would spend his one day off every week in bed just to save his family the price of a meal. You knew he wasn't making it up, that this was written from personal experience. He was scraping by and trying to make a difference in America, but James never forgot Ireland and the poverty and the inequality he had left behind. And you could see by what he was writing that he was thinking of only one thing, and that was going back home. For example, he wrote, for its freedom, the Irish working class must emancipate itself, and in emancipating itself, it must perforce free its country. You can tell that Ireland was getting closer. <laughs> James gets an invitation back to Ireland for a speaking tour. He says to Lily, we're going back. Lily says, remember the misery that we endured there. James replies, I'd rather be poor in Ireland than a millionaire here in America. The Connollys were going back home. 
James returned to an Ireland where the workers still faced the same terrible living and working conditions he'd emigrated from. But there was now a growing level of social unrest. Connolly immediately joined Jim Larkin in the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union and they began to coordinate strikes in industrial hubs like Belfast, Dublin and Wexford. There was a feeling in Ireland that a fuse was being lit beneath a powder keg. James Connolly wasn't just a visionary, he was also very, very hard-headed. For him, socialism wasn't just about the head, it was about the stomach, it was about people coming together for basic rights and acting together for basic rights. So Connolly moved from thinking to doing, from speaking out to standing up. The weaker the victim, the greater his indignation. And at the core of each issue was dignity, self-respect, holding your head up high. And with Larkin and Connolly together standing up for the workers, this was bound to irritate the very people who took advantage of cheap, unskilled labour. Publisher and tramway owner William Martin Morphy led Dublin's employers against workers' demands and unionisation. Morphy was also a supporter of home rule, whereas Connolly had always believed that home rule just meant replacing greedy British bosses with greedy Irish ones. Their war of words and ideas finally came to a head in 1913 with the lockout. 20,000 workers and 300 employers squared up for one of the most severe and significant industrial disputes in modern history. Neither side had any intention of compromising. The employers brought in scab labour from the countryside and from across the water. The Catholic Church objected to the children of strikers being taken to England to be looked after because of the unholy influence it might have on them. But at one stage, James got a group of hungry children and marched them up to Archbishop's Palace and suggested that he show as much interest in their stomachs as he had in their souls. For seven months, the lockout affected tens of thousands of Dublin's workers and their families. The strikers used mass pickets and intimidation against strike breakers, while the police batten charge rallies, even killing two workers on what is now O'Connor Street during one notorious protest, the first Bloody Sunday. In response, Larkin and Connolly formed a workers' militia, the Irish Citizen Army, a force to protect workers and their demonstrations. The lockout was the embodiment of everything Connolly has spent his life standing up for, fighting for the decency of the working class. But would it bring about the workers' republic he dreamed of? By early 1914, the locked out workers and their families were on the brink of starvation and the writing was on the wall for Connolly and the union leadership. Connolly and Larkin could not get the support of the British TUC or offers of sympathetic strikes in England. Workers returned to work and sign agreements not to be part of a union. The workers' revolution had failed. It was a terrible blow to the workers and to Connolly, but the knock-on effects were even more telling. Big Jim Larkin left Ireland for America, and in a despairing echo of Connolly's own young life, many of the striking lockout workers now chose a wage and enlisted to fight for king and country with the outbreak of World War I. Although Connolly had been in exactly the same situation as a 14-year-old in Edinburgh, as indeed members of my own family were here, he was heartbroken that the working people of Europe were enlisting to fight each other. He said, I would rather an Irish man die fighting for class freedom in his own country than in a foreign country fighting for profiteers. Connolly jokingly used to say when he was job hunting that he was looking for a new exploiter. Harry Crosby is one of Ireland's most successful employers, based in the same docks where Connolly fought his lockout. But he's also a friend and someone who likes a good argument. I thought he might give me an alternative perspective on the great James Connolly. One of the things that makes James Connolly so great is that he put forward the notion that if capitalists, if the bosses, as he called them at the time, and that was a language at the time, if the bosses lost track 
of what they were doing and treated workers just as numbers, just as numbers, yeah. that the whole thing would collapse. Well, I don't buy any single part of that. Why because not? I think that capitalism much more strongly represents the human condition than socialism. Because human beings are driven by greed, controlled by fear. We are not equal. The world is not fair. Wealth has to be created before it can be divvied up. Connolly's line was, if you forget about what you exist for and try and get bigger and bigger profits, you'll eventually collapse. And that's what's happened, not just individual businesses, but yes, it's what happened to the whole economy, Harry. But out of the ashes, there will be a whole new world will arise. Yeah, but for who's example, paying? Who's, if you, who's been born to the fire? But, but, who's been born to the fire? The ordinary workers have been born to the fire. Because it's not a fair system. The capitalists haven't been born it's to not the a fire. Fa it's never going to be fair. But the thing that he brought to Ireland and this is why I think he's the greatest Irishman, was that belief in an innate decency no. that's, that, that's I, stayed there. I, and you have it as well, by the I way. Agree with the innate, I agree with the innate decency, yeah. but the fact remains that the strong should be allowed to create wealth. That wealth yeah. should then be distributed. And then, crucially, there should be a compassion at the bottom end of society that no, but the weaker members do not fall below a certain accepted civilised standard. Yeah. Everybody's entitled to a house. Everybody is entitled to full education services. Everybody is entitled to health. And after that, the best in society, well, the Harry, strongest and the brainiest, just, should be allowed to, to create wealth and distribute it by way yeah, of you've taxes. But just, you've, just, you've just quoted the, the proclamation. Correct. You have, written but by... I'm a, written but by, a, I'm a written capitalist. By, written by James Connolly. By 1915, Connolly's aspirations for a workers' republic were as far away as ever. At the funeral of O'Donovan Rossa, Parik Pierce said that an Ireland on free shall never be at peace. James found himself agreeing with Pierce. He also found himself captured on moving pictures for the only time in his life. Connolly was fed up with the glorification of dead Fenians. He said it was time to concentrate on some living ones. James was moving towards the idea of revolution, armed revolution. Croydon Park and Marina was where the Irish citizen army drilled with hurlies. At the same time, IRB man Michael Collins was drilling with wooden rifles in a gymnasium in London, and Ayrs and Childers was bringing arms into Hoth for the Irish volunteers. Many motivations, one endgame. The demands of the World War took the British government's focus away from Dublin. This offered the likes of Connolly, Pearce, Clark, Kant and others the opportunity to develop their plans. Michael Collins is regarded as the originator of guerrilla warfare in Ireland in the later War of Independence against the British. But James Connolly, the ex-British soldier, put an awful lot of thought into his own military tactics. He said, I'm going to fight the way I want, not the way the enemy wants. It will be a new way, one for which the soldiers have not been trained to deal with. Perhaps it was Connolly who inspired Collins. Connolly was straining at the leash for revolution. In January 1916, he was kidnapped by those in the secret Irish Republican Brotherhood who wanted to talk him out of launching any attack too soon. They wanted him to wait. They all eventually agreed on an Easter rebellion. On the Monday morning, Pierce may have been political leader, but James Connolly was the military leader, the commander of all the armed forces. And he told his men, there's no citizen army now, a volunteer force. We are all part of the Irish Republican Army. And as he got to the steps of Liberty Hall, he turned to his good friend, William O'Brien, and said, we are all going to be slaughtered. Imagine that long march from Liberty Hall, up Lower Abbey Street, onto Sackville Street. It's Bank Holiday Monday. This moment is the crux of the story. But for most Irish people, this is the opening chapter in the story of James Connolly's greatness and legacy.
But as we have seen, it was actually the final chapter. Heath had 48 years of a full life, born into poverty, eking out an entire lifetime at the heart of the working class. Now he was prepared to lay down his life for the Irish people, a workers' republic free from economic slavery. The attack signal was to be the Angelus Bell at midday. On the first peal, the great James Connolly shouted, left turn, the GPO, charge! It was a mark of Connolly's reputation that the first place the British Army bombarded was Liberty Hall. If you're in any doubt of James Connolly's greatness, Michael Collins, a minor player here in the GPO, said, I would have followed him through hell. Connolly had already been wounded in the arm, but tried to keep it quiet for the sake of the morale of the men. But on Thursday, while expecting a barricade here in Princess Street, he was shot in the ankle by a sniper's dumb dumb bullet. He was revered by our other heroes. Pierce wrote, Connolly is wounded, but still the guiding brain of our resistance. Perhaps his one military flaw was that his socialist logic made him believe that British capitalists would never bomb their own property or their own people. After four days of military bombardment, the injured Connolly was carried off down Henry Street towards Moore Street. The leaders were trying to make their way to safe refuge on Parnell Street. They never made it. On Saturday morning, they surrendered here in Moor Street. Patrick Pierce's handwritten surrender had to be countersigned by James Connolly so that his Irish citizen army forces would respect the decision. The course of Irish history changed forever that week because of the great James Connolly and what happened on the streets of Dublin and his daughter Nora later recorded her own evocative account. When we came to O'Connell Street, we could hardly keep the tears back. It was in ruins, the smell of burning almost unbearable. The general post office was open to the sky. All around it, buildings were down, but its four walls stood. It was Ina who found out where my father was. He was in Dublin Castle, but there was no permission to see him. All his old enemies came out to bay for his blood. William Martin Murphy, the newspaper and tramway owner from the lockout, said Connolly should be singled out and dealt with. The Home Rule Redmond Knights at Westminster applauded the forced executions and Cardinal Logue telegraphed the Pope, the insurrection is happily terminated. But would the British really execute a wounded man? Morning after morning brought news of executions. It was a long, drawn-out agony. All day long, every day, wondering what names of our newly dead we would read tomorrow. It's fascinating to read the editorials in the Irish Times and the Irish Independent for the days and weeks after the rising. For example, the Irish Times editorial on the morning of May the 12th, 
The editorial said the British government had found it imperative to inflict the most severe sentences on the organisers and commanders who took the active part in the fighting. Any other course, according to the Irish Times, would have been treachery to the Empire, to its allies, and treachery above all to the loyal citizens of Ireland. The first execution took place on May the 3rd. Over the next nine days, 13 more were carried out. James Connolly's day of reckoning was to be on May the 12th. His wife Lily and his daughter Nora were allowed one final visit. My father lifted his head from the pillow as we came in. You know what this means, he said. Mama broke down. Don't, Lily, he said. Don't. You'll unman me. But your beautiful life, James, she sobbed. Your beautiful life. And he said, But hasn't it been a full life, Lily? And isn't this a good end? James Connolly would be the last man executed in the aftermath of the Rising. The outrage over shooting a wounded man became so great, his execution inadvertently saved the lives of almost 100 others who had been condemned to death. Connolly was shot, sitting down, tied to a chair on the morning of May the 12th, 1916. The doctor watching on said, he was the bravest man I have ever known. He gripped the sides of the chair to steady himself, held his head high, waiting for the volley. James Connolly was the greatest Irish person who ever lived. Above all, he believed in treating the ordinary worker not as a commodity for sale, but with respect and dignity. And others may label him a communist or a socialist dreamer, but above all, he believed in one big vision, a better society for all throughout his entire unselfish life. And if that is not greatness, I don't know what is. I think Ireland was lucky to have James Connolly and we certainly could do what it's like today. So vote for Ireland's greatest revolutionary hero. It's with pride and honour I ask you to vote for James Connolly. Oh, where, oh, where is our James Connolly? Where, oh, where can that gallop if you agree with Joe Duffy and want to vote for James Connolly as Ireland's greatest, call 1513 71 7103 or text GREAT followed by the number 3253125. Five. Viewers in Northern Ireland can also text 53125 or call the number on screen. Or you can vote now for Michael Collins, Bono, John Hume or Mary Robinson using their vote numbers on screen. Full details are on RTE Airtel page 197 and online at rte.ie forward slash Ireland's Greatest. Voting will close during the Late Late Show on Friday the 22nd of October when the final results will also be revealed.